Ani Bajo Ningwa Kwe Dishnikaz, Wawashkesh Dodem, Zagin Donjaba, Mugwachanandam, Gikwajmago, Mumpicha Gigrayan. Now, for those of you who aren't lucky enough to be on a Shnabe, I'll explain what I just said. As uh, Michael explained, uh, my spirit name is Ningwa Kwe, and in the English language it means um, Rainbow Woman. I'm of the Deer Clan, and I come from the Chippewas of Saugeen First Nation. So it was an absolute honor to be asked to come and moderate this event with uh, Lee Miracle and John Ralston Saul. Um, I just happened to mention it to my daughter last week. She lives in BC. And I said, oh, by the way, did I tell you that I'm doing this thing on Saturday afternoon? And she sends me back this email with a, an emoticon on it, a great huge smile, and said, wow, you're rubbing elbows with two of Canada's most prolific and esteemed authors. <laughs> so trying to quiet my nerves, it helped that I've known Lee for about a quarter of a century. I figured out when we first met uh, when we were doing that work uh, with Diane Hill. So that helped calm me a little bit, but when I uh, read her bio to see what she's been doing over the years, because I've seen you off and on over the years, just a few minutes here and there at different events, and then when I was reading your bio as well, I thought, oh, wow, yeah, it is an honor. But I want to congratulate the people at uh, Mwekwadong, particularly Wasanaban, for having the vision to bring these two people in. That's quite an accomplishment for Owen Sound. I thought when I moved back to... <laughs> I thought when I moved back to uh, Zagin from Toronto that I was going to be coming home to a life of relative obscurity. And it was just nine short months ago that I moderated the event when Paul Martin came in to talk about his Aboriginal Youth Entrepreneurship Program, so much for relative obscurity. It's my pleasure, my absolute pleasure, to introduce our first speaker, Lee Maracle. She's a member of the Stolo Nation in British Columbia. And when I first met her, um, she, was with, she was part of a group that had been brought in. Uh, Jeanette Armstrong was also part of that group, and they had told us about this fabulous school out in BC that they had just started or had been going on for a while. And it's the Anaukan International School of Writing. It's in Penticton. What really touched my heart was when I read the philosophy of this school. And I, I wrote it down here so I wouldn't misquote it. As indigenous people, the creator has given us a way of life and natural laws which govern our relationship to all living things. And I could tell just by the way Lee reacted when the singers and the, the drummers were here that this was such a touching event for her to experience this from another nation because, as I said, Lee is from the Solo Nation and to experience something from the Anishinaabek Nation, I, I could tell it really meant a lot. And as uh, my daughter said to me, Lee is one of uh, Canada's most prolific Aboriginal authors in Canada and she's recognized as an authority on issues to do with Aboriginal people and Aboriginal literature. She's been publishing her work since the early 70s, and uh, I think it was Bobby Lee, your first uh, novel that came out, and she has produced many, many works since then. She has done outstanding work in nearly every literary genre. She doesn't just write novels, she also writes short stories, and what I was told at that course that you and uh, Jeanette were part of teaching, it's often harder to write a short story than it is to write a novel. <laughs> Lee also writes uh, poetry, creative nonfiction anthologies, and works of cultural criticism. I won't even name the books that she's written, the list is too long, and I was told to keep the intro short so we could have the time for our two authors here. She's a, a distinguished visiting professor at Cana of Canadian culture at Western Washington University. I think I need to take a drink. You probably can tell my mouth is very dry. Just have to remember which cup I drank out of. There's several of them up here. 
She's an instructor in the Aboriginal um, Studies Program at the University of Toronto, where she teaches oral tradition of the Ojibwe, Salish, and Longhouse people. She's also a traditional teacher in residence at the First Nations House, which is where a lot of Aboriginal students go to hang out with each other and support each other and learn a little bit more about um, how it is to be an Aboriginal person living in a huge city like Toronto. She was also an instructor with the Center for Indigenous Theatre, which is where my daughter met you. And the Center for Indigenous Theatre now has a three-year full-time program, as well as two summer programs in Peterborough and Lethbridge, Alberta. So what an accomplishment for this uh, small little group that started out from very humble beginnings a number of years ago. Lee is also an instructor in something called SAGE. And SAGE stands for Support for Aboriginal Graduate Education. She volunteers with ANDPAVA, which is the Association for Natives Developing in the Performing and Visual Arts. In 2009, she received an honorary doctorate of letters, and I believe that was from St. Thomas, right? In 2012, she received the Queen's Jubilee Medal for her work promoting writing among Aboriginal youth. And she spends a lot of her time doing healing and cultural reclamation work. So I could hear you cheering them on about the uh, truth and reconciliation. Uh, last year, she was the recipient of the Premier's Award for Excellence in the Arts. And this award is given each year to an Ontario artist whose work has contributed to her community and culture for at least a decade. So that's recognizing your longtime work in this field. And I actually know what that means because I've been to the Stalo Nation. This is agreement and uh, just recognizing um, good things. She's a member of the Urban Indigenous Theatre Company of Board of Directors, and I don't know that I really need to say this because this is about Lee's accomplishments, but she also happens to be the granddaughter of Chief Dan George. So with that, I'm going to ask Lee to come up and share some of her wisdom with you. Miigwech. sound many times, I continue to get lost here. <laughs> Up the hill and down the hill and all that sort of stuff. Can my daughters wave at me? There they are, my drivers. I have to feed them later. <laughs> so we're scoping the restaurants. <laughs> um, I'm so glad they came with me. They've been here too. Uh, we did work, uh, healing work many years ago people uh, from the local reservation here. And uh, I've also done educational work here. And that's how I met, um, met is it Mary? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm a bit nervous. And I also met Lenore Kishig Debias, who was uh, a writer when I met her. I think she's dropped the Tobias. Is that right, Lenore? <laughs> I'm looking for you. <laughs> And of course, her good partner there, uh, many years ago, uh, 25 years ago. So this is the first time, Lenore, though, that I've seen you in your home. And thank you so much for welcoming me. This talk is about going forward. And as you know, the report was submitted. Nothing has happened since then uh, because it was a submission of a report. It's 388 pages as a summary. I haven't finished reading it yet, but I am going to go through it line by line. And I didn't care so much about this process six years ago when it started, except that I started to understand my father. We had a little bit of a strange relationship I called him Uncle Bobby most of my life because he wasn't married to my mother and he had two wives at the same time. They were also best friends and one knew about the other, but the wife didn't know about my mother. 
And then she found out about my mother and me and my sisters and brothers when, she, when I was about 35. And she had named one of her children to honor my mother, her name, my mother's name, Fran. <laughs> so she was a little bit perturbed <laughs> when she found out that was my father's mistress. And she had named one of her children after one of my brothers. And so I have two brothers, Gordon. And we want to call one Gordy and the other Gordo <laughs> to solve this problem. The two brothers, Gordy and Gordo, are not related. <laughs> they have another father. So this family is a very mixed up situation. But the siblings all got together five years ago, right one year after the reconciliation commission started and decided to reconcile with each other. We did not go to residential school. Our parents did. And we inherited all this fracturing and discord and blended families that were not blended. You know, they should have been blended, but they were not. We should have been friends with each other, but we were not. And we decided to come together. And it turns out that most of my children knew my sister's children. They had been friends in the downtown East End and didn't realize they were also relatives. You see, so it was kind of a funny and very strange and very strange situation at first. But eventually, when we got through all the grieving, our lights went on, and we realized that we were innocent in all of this. We did not cause this. And in a certain way, our parents were innocent as well. Because of what happened to them at residential school. But yeah, last week, when that report was released, I learned more about my family. From 1883 to 1913, one half of the children died. And I remember my, my great-grandmother saying, eh, in the language, but I'll tra translate it this way, you will never know the terror of being the sole survivor of 14 children as a young woman, starting again, an entire clan, all by yourself. I will never know that fear. And partly from her work and her efforts and her struggles, we learned our medicines, we learned our traditions, we learned all kinds of things. She did not go to residential school she was one of the children that was hidden in the bush. So that's probably why she survived at home. Lots of fish to eat, plants to be gathered, and things like that. And I did not go to residential school. So I spent a lot of time with her because our parents were kind of chronically working. There were 22 of us. I have... There was actually two dozen at one time. I have 24 siblings. Two of them are in the spirit world, and the rest of us are all here. And my mother and fathers, my mothers, sorry, my mothers and fathers worked tirelessly to feed us all, clothe us all, and educate us as, as much as we wanted to be educated. And I'm grateful for that. But I went to public school. And I will say this, one of the recommendations is fairness in financial arrangements. In my public school, we were charged $11,000 for Aboriginal presence there, one child, from K to 12. That's $180,000 in our lifetimes if we graduate. But many of us did not graduate, and yet the school got to keep that money. It was the only product sold in this country 
in which you didn't have to actually receive it for the payment to go out. And that, when I got through grade 12 and I started college, they gave me, I think it was $85 a month, living allowance and my tuition which amounted to $200 a course. I went to school in the horse and buggy days. Now it's like thousands, but anyway. <laughs> At the end of my school, when they stopped funding me, they still owed me $150,000 worth of education. And everyone was telling me, why do you get a free education? I said, because you only pay $454 to go to public school I pay 30 times as much. And that's still today. That's still the case today. So there is an uneven arrangement between us. The province collects quite a lot of money. And up north, it's the habit of the schools to toss the kids out after the check comes in on October 31st. The child's out by now. That subsidizes a lot of northern non-native education. So that's part of what has to end. The inequality between us. Lots of you think, white folks especially, and uh, newcomers think that we get money from the federal government that comes from your tax base. Not a dime comes from your tax base. Not a dime. And the federal government actually gives you almost twice as much as it gives us. For every dollar spent on a Canadian, Aboriginal people get 55 cents. And they want to even that up. It has to be fair. We also want decent housing. And it's not true that we get it free. I have no house in Dalo territory in the Coast Salish people that is not paid for by Coast Salish people. Not a single one. Even when we lived in log houses and boat houses and I lived in an RCMB boat shed my mom bought for only 50 bucks. But we still paid that 50 bucks. Yeah, we don't have never lived in a house paid for by somebody else. This is another misconception. But the other part of it is the treaties. We don't have treaties where I come from yet, although they're trying to uh, get us to engage in treaty arrangements. They've only had two successes, that's two reservations. And their members are starting to challenge that because we don't want treaties of the sort they're offering. We want a nation to nation treaty. That is the whole of the Stomachs people, all of us with Canada. Our territory is about the size of France. We did not give it away. But we are not entitled to stop someone from building a home in accordance with our law. So when non-native people came here and said, can we build a house here? We said, sure. It's the, it's the land. It's the land. The land welcomes you. This land welcomes you. And as my great uncle says, every single person living in Vancouver is a stall in Stockman's territory and is a citizen of our nation, even if they're not any good at it. <laughs> so we welcome you still. You belong here. Your children belong here. You were brought here for a reason. We haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> but we hope that this report, that we will all read it, and we will discover each other. We've already discovered the land. We did it first, but that's, I'm not quibbling over that. Columbus can have his day. <laughs> You've discovered the land. And now we can discover each other.
Because during the time that we were at residential school, it, everywhere in this country, there was no trespassing signs put up on our reserves. And we never asked for that. <coughs> but that's how Canada held out its obligation, treaty obligation, to protect us. <coughs> Apparently, Canada didn't trust any of you <laughs> with our little bodies. <coughs> Uh, but I see lots of you are, you know, married to some of our lovelier women. <laughs> I guess they took the signs down out here. <laughs> but that being said, the signs were taken down, but a lot of people don't know they're allowed to go where we are. Even at university, they say, First Nations House, are, are we allowed to go there? Well, yeah, it's part of the university. <laughs> you want to learn something about us, that's where you go. <laughs> they have teachers there, they have elders, they have food sometimes. You know, you could go anywhere on campus you want. And they, no one here knows that we've believed this for longer than you've been here. That all of humanity is one great circle that black people, Asian people, red people are the two Americans and white people are one humanity. But we have believed that. At Siksika, they found the wheel. It's 800 years old, and there's a scroll that goes with it about all of these people coming here one day and forming a single community of the world people. And to get ready for it, Oxford University began, and its dream was to bring the knowledge of the world together under a single roof. Of course, that meant England, right? <laughs> but that's changed now, too. At these schools where we teach, Native studies, Aboriginal studies, Indigenous studies, Caribbean studies, African studies, Irish studies. I can't believe they're split. the British are letting the Irish in. But anyway, there you go. <laughs> All of these different uh, schools, or schools of thought are coming together. And we need to be ready for that, too, because the world's in trouble. And I'm not pointing to who started. It isn't any of us. I think somebody said it's the one percenters <laughs> that created all this trouble, and nobody asked us, you know. They're digging holes in the ground, throwing things all over the place. Uh, nobody asked us, but we're the people that have to solve it, and so we have to bring our minds together as one and see what life we can create for our children. That's what we need to do in this very near future. So anybody that has an attitude that someone else isn't good enough or someone else isn't kind enough or someone else isn't smart enough hasn't got a clue about the future. Because the first thing we need to know is every single human being is good enough and worth all our effort all our efforts. And every word that comes out of our mouths from here on in, when we're speaking to each other, we should roll it around in our prayers first to make sure that sacred text is leaving our mouths, to make sure that honor is leaving our mouths, that it's wrapped in love and kindness for one another, and that it is considerate of each other. That's what the heavens ask us for. That's what those who died in those residential schools require of us. That's what those 6,000 dead children need. That's what those children who were experimented with starvation need. That's what that's those children that were physically and emotionally abused require. Not just our children. Somebody pointed out 
Well, the British had residential schools and none of them are complaining. And I Googled it. And they are complaining. <laughs> and I said to myself, please think before you do. <laughs> you learned it in grade one, in your think and do book. Think first, look. No one that's been abused is ever happy with it. I know we all love our parents, even the ones that abuse us. Kids can't help that. They're the only ones capable of unconditional love. Adults aren't. Adults demand their children smile at the second month, don't they? <laughs> Got to get that kid smiling. Got to get out of my diapers. Got to get them talking. Got to get them to school. All of these demands we place on children. Our children don't require us to do anything even kind to us. We will love them, our parents. Even when my father wasn't kind, I loved him. Even when my mother wasn't kind, I loved her. And all of your children love you. No matter what we do, we can't shake them off. You know, they're like feathers that don't come off. <laughs> I still got my two girls <laughs> hauling me around now. I used to haul them around <laughs> all over the country. And they bring the same love to you that I bring and to my colleague, John Ralston Saul. I've only met him in the last few years, but I've followed his work and your partner's work. And so I feel like I know him. And I feel like we made a connection the day we met. He's my brother. We're on the same page. We're going in the same direction. And I know he loves you as much as I do. And that we have a long road ahead. But it's the good road. The trash is behind us. The goodness is ahead of us. Imagine that. A good life for all of us. One Canada. Imagine that. That we could share this lovely place. That we could actually care for each other and share this great land. That's what we're beginning now. And the first step was to face the truth about what residential school was all about. The next step is going to be honoring all 94 recommendations. A Band-Aid will not heal cancer, and 30 out of 90 isn't going to do it. 93 out of 94 isn't going to do it. It's going to take all those recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.